from one of your uh, att trauma attendings. Um, only been around since 2003, so if you don't know me, you know, maybe uh, give me a shout if you're interested. Um, the, uh, I'm mostly down to regional uh, and come up to the general a couple days a week, and I have a call there in the weekend coming up next, next month, so whoever's on call with me, be ready. Um, we're going to talk about a couple things. Uh, I was uh, charged with speaking about uh, complex uh, femoral nailing uh, and also superconductive femur fractures. So uh, we know, so I'll just start. Um, we know that, uh, there we go, not, okay. Can you guys see that? Good. So we know that the treatment for femoral shaft fractures, the gold standard is um, basically a femoral nail. Uh, fractures two centimeters below the lesser troke or uh, seven, seven centimeters above the knee are treated with any nail, right? You take a broomstick and put it in there and it's gonna work. Um, we prefer a larger nail if possible. These days, I think mostly we're putting 11s, but the bigger the nail you can put in, uh, the more stable the construct and uh, the earlier the weight bearing of the patient. Uh, we wanna give the patients opportunity to be weight bearing tolerated as soon as possible. When the majority of these patients, um, you know, that uh, you, you, you get to nail, should be weight bearing is tolerated uh, if you feel like the construct is strong enough. There's about a 94% union rate. There's a prospective randomized study comparing uh, proximal femoral uh, plates and nails uh, published two years ago that showed that basically uh, the, the non-union the non rate is 6% uh, for nailing and 14% uh, for plating. So uh, nail is definitely the gold standard. Uh, and I'd, Old question, do we ream or don't we ream? Um, the advantage of reaming are that uh, nail does not get incarcerated in, in the bone. You can get higher union rates from reaming versus unreaming. It's a more stable, durable fracture uh, nail construct because the nail size is bigger and you have early weight bearing because the nail is bigger. So it's much more stable construct. Unream nails, uh, you know, the problem with reaming is essentially fat emboli, right? So uh, when do you get fat emboli? You get fat, fat emboli when you insert uh, an opening reamer, inserting your guide wire, manipulating the femur, flexible reaming, and putting your nail in. So you get fat emboli in all those steps. Uh, when you use un unreamed nails, you still get fat emboli, not as much because you're not, you don't have that middle step where you're reaming, but you still get uh, fat emboli uh, with, um, insertion of the nail and uh, open, you have to open the, the canal, so opening reamer. Uh, so you still get uh, fat emboli from that. Um, so it's not that much of a difference um, as far as the fat emboli. Does anybody, anybody, uh, everybody still awake there? Does anybody know what some of the symptoms are of uh, fat emboli syndrome? Like shortness of breath, and I think sometimes they can put the TKI in their chest. Yeah. Hypotension. Yep. And there's a, there's a really nice, um, there's a question that you guys are going to get that talks just about that. Um, they had me put a bunch of questions together for these two talks. So I don't know when you get those, but um, those are all questions that you'll see. They're essentially uh, ABOS type questions that have answers and references. So um, hopefully that'll give you some, uh, you know, some information as well. So let's talk about malalignment. Um, uh, we know that it's associated with proximal third and distal third fractures, um, and uh, especially with comminuted segmental fractures, because the way you get your read for um, length, alignment, and rotation, uh, if it's a simple fracture, it winds up being from the uh, bone itself. But if it's uh, you know, looking at it visually with the uh, C-arm, but if you can't have those landmarks, you basically aren't able to do that. So uh, it's difficult to get length, alignment, um, uh, and rotation with uh, those type of fractures. Um, you know, uh, it's less likely, obviously, with middle third, stable fracture pattern. And it doesn't matter if you do anterograde versus retrograde or trick versus piriformis, for mid-shaft fractures, you get about the same. So what are some methods of determining alignment? Uh, frontal plane alignment 
uh, is done. Uh, there are many ways of doing this. One is what's called the cable technique. And the idea is you get a, a centralized CR image on the uh, femoral head, uh, a centralized CR image with the knee extended to the patella exactly in the middle of the condyles, um, uh, centered uh, C arm, and then the ankle. You take a cable and you basically bisect all of those uh, and you take the cable all the way from the hip down to the ankle and see where the knee is relative to that um, cable. If you did it on the contralateral side, you'll know if you're in varus or valgus. Um, so that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, another, and that's what it would look like. Uh, how do you check length? Another way is basically the patient's on the fracture table. Um, you take a piece of metal and put it next to the leg. Um, and uh, you take images proximally and distally of the non-affected leg first. Um, and then you do the same thing on the contralateral side that's broken. Um, and the, it's pretty straightforward. You don't want to put the, um, the piece of metal on top of the thigh because you get parallax. You know, these are C arms are cone beams, uh, which means that uh, you get parallax at the ends unless you have a flat panel. The flat panels don't have parallax at the end. So uh, you want to put it next to the femur. And then you can measure whatever that rod is length, and then you can essentially uh, recreate that on the contralateral side. So how do we avoid shortening after we put the nail in? Uh, there are several cases, and I don't know if Puku is still on the line, but several a couple cases at, at SFGH where uh, either the um, uh, distal locking screw was missed or was not placed, and the patient had shortening. So the way you avoid shortening is you basically uh, uh, nail and then lock every single nail. So when you go out in practice and you're all on your own and you want to save that one step of you know, not locking distally, don't save that step. Do it. It's worth the extra five minutes to lock distally. Um, so proximally, you're going to lock using the targeter and distally, you're going to lock freehand technique. Um, so make sure you do that. Get a good lateral view. And uh, this is obviously a buttress screw instead of a locking screw. So good to get a good lateral view, make sure you completely uh, black out that hole to make sure you're in the right position. And I'll show you some cases on, of stuff. Some techniques to avoid malrotation in simple cases. Um, uh, you can line up the cortices and thicknesses and look at them on the AP and lateral view. Um, and uh, you can also look at the diameter. Uh, those, those are the two very simple ways of doing it. Uh, it's not helpful with comminution, obviously. Um, study done by uh, Credic and McPlow now, you know, more than 15 years ago, looked at the lesser trochanteric sign. The lesser trochanteric sign, basically, uh, you get a, an AP of the hip uh, with the patella straight up. So the patella has to be exactly in the middle of the femoral condyles. And the, knee, the, and the thigh has to be flat. Uh, it can't have uh, any flexion. So basically you get that and then you center the lesser troke on, in the center of the image. Uh, you uh, save that image, then go to the knee, make sure you're in the right position of the knee, and then go to the fracture side and recreate the lesser troke size. Um, pretty straightforward uh, thing to do, just have to remember to do it. Uh, remember the lesser troke is a posterior structure. So the more internal rotated the proximal fragment is, uh, the more, the less you're gonna see the lesser troke and the more external rotate, rotated the proximal fragment is, the more you see the lesser troke. And it's vice versa for distal, right? When we say it's external rotated, the reason why you're not seeing the lesser troke is because the distal fragment is externally rotated relative to the proximal fragment, which is internally rotated. Okay, so don't, don't get um, confused on, on that uh, verbiage. Same thing with internal rotation of the distal fragment, it's, it's internally rotated relative to the proximal fragment, which is externally rotated. And that's why you see more of the lesser trochanter um, when the patient's uh, leg is internally rotated with the patella straight up. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Um, another way of doing it, and this is called a version test. This was described uh, by Tornetta. Um, and what he described in his study was uh, you go to the unaffected leg and you get a perfect lateral of the uh, neck, which takes um, uh, out the version. So uh, the, on the, on the non-broken leg. 
which means that the head, the neck, and the shaft are lined up, as you see in the bottom right image. Um, so you want to get that view, and then you want to go down to the knee or vice versa. I go to the knee first and go then up to the hip and get a perfect lateral of the uh, femoral condyles um, distally. And a perfect lateral of femoral condyles is when the posterior aspect and the distal aspect of the femoral condyles are exactly overlapping. They create one line. That's how you get a perfect lateral of the knee. So um, you, get, you get those two images and then you'll, you'll see between in the C arm that there'll be a difference of let's say 15 degrees or something, okay? So you're gonna look on the back of the C arm and you'll see the difference that there's about a 15 degree difference between the femoral condyles and the hip. So you do that on, it can be anything. I mean, it's a huge, there's a huge variability from patient to patient, but um, you know, you wanna just check the non broken leg. And then when you uh, fix the broken leg, you wanna re recreate that rotation. Um, again, you measure the, you make sure the knee is straight up and down, and then you measure the version uh, uh, proximally, taking out the version essentially, and then looking on the back of the C arm at the angle difference. Remember, don't, don't get fooled by one thing, which is remember that the femoral neck is an anterior structure, right? Femoral neck is a little bit anterior relative to the shaft of the femur. So, um, you know, you still can get the, uh, uh, a good lateral. You just make sure you, whatever you're seeing on the non-broken side, you need to recreate on the broken side. And it's good to save those images. So here's an example. This hey, is Dr. Malayaku, can I ask a quick question? As many as you want. We've, we've talked about coronal plane rotation and length. Uh, what about sagittal plane? So varus valgus? No, like flexion extension. Oh, I'll talk about that. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Um, so uh, for sagittal plane, I'm going to talk about it in, in two places. One will be when I speak about supracondral femur fractures, because in proximal, in proximal fractures, it's obvious when you're flexed. You know what I mean? Because you get a lateral view, it's obvious that you have apex anterior angulation, which is the most common. So that's very obvious. But distally, if you have a femoral, uh, a supracondral femur fracture. Um, and I'll show you the one we're doing right now in the operating room. So you see what I'm talking about. I just took a, a picture for you guys. So we just fixed this thing. You guys see that? Okay. So this is, this is right now in the operating room. And so we got the articular surfaces as well as we could get with all the comminution. And then the next thing is to get the Varus valgus flexion extension, you know, pro and re bottom correct. Yeah. And the way we're going to do that, I'll show you in a minute how, how we do that, okay? Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so uh, this is a, an obvious example of a patient that has um, a comminuted femur fracture. She is a 38-year-old woman uh, minding her own business and gets shot in the leg um, and has uh, this comminuted femur fracture. So if you guys had to guess, would you say this is a high velocity or a low velocity injury? Just general terms, not thinking about the uh, feet per second. High velocity. Yeah, because you see all that comminution, right? So when you're approaching this type of patient, you should be thinking, uh, even though there's like a, maybe a small open wound and, a, big, and, and a, a little bigger exit wound, you should be thinking, maybe I needed to breathe this. And the reason why I'm saying that is because with the high velocity injuries, high velocity gunshot wounds, there's a, a big vacuum effect essentially uh, pulling in debris from the outside uh, and also a lot of comminution with devascularized tissue. So, um, you know, something to think about. So this patient basically went to the operating room. She also had a femoral artery transection, which had to be, uh, this was done at the general, which had to be redone. She also had a, a, you know, she was shot through the tibia, but we don't need to go there because it's not the topic. And then we got this, uh, you know, we put the nail in and the question is how do we get uh, length alignment rotation? So this is exactly that patient that, you know, you see how much bone loss there is because of the debridement. This is exactly that patient that you have to follow all those little guidelines that we had a few minutes ago, okay? That's a very important uh, thing to think about. Keep in mind that trauma surgeons used to get sued most commonly for uh, femoral rotation, malalignment. Okay, that, that was the most common. Uh, today, it's more 
missed compartment syndrome, but that, that was the most common thing. So uh, I'll, I'm gonna get to your uh, you know, flexion extension in a minute. So this is a, how I set up the patients in the operating room. I know that you have uh, influence from different um, attendings, depending on how they like to set things up. Um, nobody does, as far as I know, hemilithotomy position for femur fractures. And the reason why that is because uh, there's two reasons. One is the well leg has a small but real rate of compartment syndrome when you're in hemilithotomy position. And the, and the second reason why is because when you're doing an anti-grade femoral nail and you want to uh, do a uh, piriformis start, you have to be able to control the pelvis. And what happens is, if you guys can see me here, what happens is as you pull, let's say you're pulling on this side, as you're pulling on it with the hemilithotomy position, the pelvis tilts. And the pelvis tilts is very hard to get your femoral nail in. So what we do with, uh, with the scissoring position is basically we're pulling on both legs, not exactly equally. Obviously, we're pulling more on the fractured side, but what we're doing is we're trying to pull uh, and keep the pelvis stable. And what that does basically is gives us an opportunity to get in more easily for piriformis start nails. Okay, so this is the image you can get from scissoring position. There's no issues uh, with getting a, a lateral view. Um, so uh, we also, I also like to use extra medullary reduction techniques. So if some people will use a crutch um, I don't like the crutch so much because basically uh, the crutch goes all the way down to the floor and, and creates a, a problem for the C-arm. So, you know, we have these fracture tables and you can just basically take an arm positioner uh, and attach it to the table and then lift up to hold the, the fragments in the right position. So some extra medullary ways of doing it. Here's the same case. You can see that the patient is prepped and, uh, being prepped. I'm going to talk about uh, trochanteric entry nails. Um, what are the indications for those? I think in, in my mind, the indications are any fractures that are above lesser troch. <coughs> um, obviously, uh, any pertrochanteric fracture, any patients that uh, are large and par it's hard to get in a piriformis start, uh, and anytime you need a more lateral start site. Um, you know, the problem with it is it's out of line nailing. So if you have a subtroch fracture, um, you're more likely to be embarrassed unless you uh, get the entry point exactly correct. Um, and it's very hard with medial comminution because the guide wire tends to fall into that medial side. Um, piriformis start snail, you know, they have the most data as far as uh, mid shaft femur fractures and functional outcome data. It's in line nailing, which means it's much easier for uh, subtrochs and uh, there's no problem with any medial comminution because you're going right down the pipe. You don't have to worry about proximal bend of the nail uh, where where the start site is relative to the greater troch, etc. Because the start site is always in the same place. It's obviously not good for fractures above lesser troch and the reason why that is because a piriformis start is posterior. I'll show you that in a second. It's posterior and you basically fall out the back. So uh, that, that's a problem with it. Um, it's also very difficult with obese patients. So in trochanteric nails, how do you avoid varus? The way you avoid varus is basically proper insertion point. Um, and that's the time to take your time to make sure you're exactly in the right position. So obviously that is gonna be for every single nail out there, except for the lateral femoral nail, uh, which is a 12 degree proximal bend. All the other nails are between four and six degrees proximal lateral bends. And so the entry point, that's too far lateral, that's too far medial, and that's kind of the money, right? Um, so that, that's kind of where, where you want to be for trochanteric entry nail. So most nails we would say are for trochanteric en entry nail, we're actually, you know, doing a, um, you know, trochanteric slash piriformis start. So we're starting on the medial most part, um, of the, of the trochanter, we call that trochoformis sometimes. So that's the most common place where we start. And if you look from the top, this is from a study from Ostrom, but if you look from the top, you'll see that that location is too far lateral, that location is too far, is where it's supposed to be, that location is too far medial. And then I'm gonna go back a second, and you'll see that the, the black dot is actually the piriformis start. So the piriformis start is very close to your correct entry for um, the uh, troch entry nail, right? And that's a, that's a little bit too far medial. 
So he did a study looking at, and this is just an interesting study, looking at entry point uh, in 2005. So, you know, old school data, but still good. He did a bunch of, uh, he took a bunch of cadavers and, and uh, did uh, subtroke osteotomies and put different nails in. Uh, and what he did was he chose nails that had different proximal bends. So if you look at the proximal bends, uh, the gammas at four, TFN is six, uh, uh, TAN from um, Smith and FU is five, and the Holland nail, which is an old nail we don't see anymore, was 10. And what he did was he, he went by the technique guide and said, okay, I'm gonna be too far lateral, as you see on the left side, in the right position, or too far medial, let's see what happens. And what he did was, even with the exact correct location, with different nails, he found that you could be embarrassed even if you follow the technique guide. So if you look at the TFN and the gamma nail, you'll see that you're in, you know, that it's a subtroke fracture, which is embarrassed because the nail diameter also makes a difference. So the bigger the, the bigger the nail, the more medial you have to be essentially. Okay. And it, so the reason why that is because you think you can think about it as a pivot, the distal medial part of the nail, um, essentially interacts with the medial prox the proximal cort the proximal fracture cortex on the medial side and then causes it to rotate into the varus. So something to think about. Uh, way to avoid that is just ream a little more distally with a bigger reamer. So piriformis fossa, remember that's a posterior structure um, and the trochanteric is, is more of a bulbous structure. Uh, if you look at the AP view there on the right, you'll see that the entry point is, that's about the right entry point, just on the medial side of, of the greater troke. Also look at the lesser troke and you'll see the lesser troke you can see, but not that well. So that means that this hip is internally rotated or we took the version out. And that's what you wanna do when you're uh, putting in a troke entry nail. You wanna actually get the version out. And the way you do that is you take the C-arm and you go over the top and that gives you a good view of the neck as well as the greater troke enter. Um, a lateral view, obviously you want to be in line with the head, neck, and shaft. You can see that there. So the piriformis start, which is on the white, the white uh, uh, arrow, is just posterior to the choke start. You guys see that? It's pretty close, but it's, it's, in, the, it's in a different location. The reason why I'm harping on entry is because I think in practice, most people do choke entry nails because the number one fracture type you see is a hip fracture and you only see femur fractures once in a while. So most people are using choke entry nails. In trauma centers, it's probably mixed, but in other places, mostly trochs. So that's why I'm harping on this. Okay, so you have to watch out for the oval. What that means is that you ream, ream, and ream, and then boom, you get an oval, and then your nail winds up being too far lateral and you go into varus, okay? So you have to try and avoid that as much as possible. Use a one-step reamer essentially, which is what most people use anyway. And that creates a hole and gets you in the right place. Okay, so again, this is why uh, we use a, a troke entry site. I want to show you a couple of proximal fractures because those, those are the harder ones. This is an 85 year old woman. She had an MVA in 2006. Uh, she has nine kids, by the way, so she's tough. And she uh, uh, had this fracture, was treated somewhere else uh, in this way. And you can see that the proximal fragment is in varus but the tip apex distance is really good. We're not gonna talk about that too much today because that's more in, in, in uh, the hip fracture talks. So what happens to her, she comes to see us. She's in a little bit of varus. So what do you guys think will happen? Anybody, any ideas? Non-union. Okay, yeah, non-union hardware failure, right? So what happened here is the patient comes in to me for uh, you know two years later and she has this uh, non-union with broken hardware. Uh, and at this point, you know, you have to make a decision what you're gonna do. You'll notice that there's two things going on here. One is, is, is she's embarrassed, but the other one is on the lateral view, uh, to the left is anterior and she has apex anterior angulation. So those two things were missed. So we took her to the operating room and did a, a big surgery. She did actually really well, thank goodness. Okay. So what are the steps? Just uh, generally speaking for troke entry nail. Um, this is what the thigh, somebody, yep, thank you. Um, this is what the thigh looks like. You can see the, that the, um, um, let's see if you guys can see my, you guys see the mouse? So this is the greater troke enter. I just go a couple fingers proximal to it. 
um, making it, making a poke hole incision with a guide wire. Um, get the guide wire to be in line with uh, the head, neck, and shaft. Okay, on the AP and lateral view, there's the AP view uh, just on the medial side of the great stroke. There's your reamer. Guide wire goes in. And then what you want to do is you want to put in your nail, use the anterior bow of the femoral nail to your advantage and uh, hold the uh, reamer, uh, the, the, guide, the guide like straight up and down. And then as you place the nail in, rotate the nail in and that will get you in much more easily. So that, so you put it in like this, this is, this is old school nail, you guys have probably never seen. But basically, uh, it goes uh, straight at A to P, and then you rotate laterally in order to make sure it's in the, in the right position when you're done. Okay, so something like that. Okay, how do you know that your, if you're going to put screws uh, proximally, how do you know that they're going to go into the femoral head? What you do is you make the nail and targeter um, uh, sleeve be in line with the shaft and the neck and the head. So that's not in line, that is in line. And then you can get those screws in if you, as you need to. Um, this is distal locking. So 29 year old male, I'm gonna do a little supracondylar femur fracture. If you, actually, I'll skip that for, till the next one. One second. Any questions so far or, or is it uh, pretty straightforward? Do you, do you always uh, protect the neck? That's a good we question. Did you, guys just do, yeah. did you guys just do a look at a study on that? Yeah, this morning. So that's, yeah. I'm curious that's what right. your take is. Yeah, I read that study. Um, uh, honestly, I don't always protect the neck. And the reason why that is because um, frequently we have, it depends on the patient, but frequently we're, we're taking care of patients who are polytrauma patients. Um, and so those patients get a retrograde nail because they have, let's say, a pelvis, a femur, whatever. Um, and so I get, I get uh, serum imaging. I look at the CT pre-op, which we always have, and then I look at the in, intra-op imaging. If I have any questions, I put screws up there. If it looks perfect, I leave it alone. I know there's a small percentage of patients where it's missed, but um, it's, it's pretty small. And if you look at our, uh, you know, uh, our patients at, at SFGH and at UCSF and here, um, you know, I can't remember, I can't remember maybe one that was missed. Can you guys, anybody as a collective, can you guys remember of any that were missed after femoral nailing? Ugh, just the one that found a drop. Not after. If there's one that I remember that was picked up and dropped. But. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you pick it up and drop, you didn't miss it, right? So uh, let's keep going. So this is a, a basically a substroke shaft fracture. Um, Maybe somebody from the group can talk about how they would set this patient up. There's your AP view, and there's your lateral view. And I can tell you that you can tell from the soft tissues that the patient has a lot, uh, large amount of soft tissues. So uh, my question is, how would you, what would you do with this patient? What are your thoughts? Euler? How about somebody in the Parnassus library? Uh, I think, you know, with a lot of soft tissue, you're probably going to err towards a um, trochanteric start site uh, for all the reasons you already mentioned that, it, you know, if uh, it's going to be challenging to get a piriformis start site because you're going to need to be more medial and in line initially with the femur. So that can be quite challenging in obese patients. So probably err on, on the side of caution and go for a troch start. Okay. And then how about positioning in the operating room? Uh Kind of hard to tell from the x-ray but this looks pretty proximal like in the sub truck yeah, yeah, there you go i mean you know probably um you could go either free leg nailing or you could do this on a fracture table um our experience at sfgh is probably more attendings than not would do this free leg nailing because um you know it's like a sub truck fracture and it's going to be a little harder to position the or to control the um uh, sagittal plane deformity on a, as you were mentioning, with you know, like a crutch is an option. I've never seen the arm board technique, but probably a free leg technique would be what we'd see most, I think. Okay. So if you're, don't, don't hang up yet. 
So don't mute yourself yet. So if you're, um, you know, you're by yourself, you're down, you're at uh, CPMC, and you're going to fix this fracture. How are you going to do it? What kind, what's your setup in the operating room? So I'm not saying you're there with Dr. Morshed or whatever. I'm, what I'm saying is it's you doing it. Yeah. So I would probably do this on a, a you know, flat top table, free leg technique. I'd put them in, uh, I'd make sure they're all the way at the edge of the bed. I can get a good start site uh, for a troke entry nail. I would put them in, um, probably just put them in uh, femoral, uh, distal femoral traction, making sure my guide wire is quite anterior. So it's not gonna bind up my, or uh, K wire is anterior. It's not gonna bind up the guide wire or the nail going down. Um, you know, get control, you know, get the, the traction in line on the contralateral side. And then I, you know, you can, you can help with, or you can use that to get your length and you can also help with your rotation. I would, for this, I would probably, you know, it looks like you get a decent read, I think cortically, but rotation might be a challenge. So I would probably, before I uh, prepped out, I would probably get contralateral uh, images uh, to help with version and rotation. So I would do the, you know, perfect lateral, the contralateral knee, swing up to 90, come up and get the piriformis uh, or the, uh, the lesser trope to see what that looks like, save those images. And then I would uh, move to the other side uh, and, you know, prep and drape and, and nail it. Okay. And I would protect the neck. Yeah. So that's that. Well, here, I think it's impossible. Well, not impossible, but unlikely you're going to use a pure form of sword nail anyway, right? So all the trope yeah. will go up in the head. Yeah. The only other, the only thing I would say, only criticism of what you just said is that the patient, this side has a broken lesser trope. So if you're going to do rotation, you probably would need to use a femoral neck. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that's, that yeah, was all that's good. So here's what actually was done. This is actually set SFGH, uh, the old SFGH. Um, the patient is obviously pretty large. If it was, can you guys see it still? Yeah. I lost something. Okay, sorry, just having technical difficulties. Um, so uh, can you guys see it, the image? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, what we did here is, uh, so in today's world, I would do this a little bit differently. Actually, I would do this lady in uh, lateral decubitus position. And the reason why that is because lateral decub for this type of injury in an obese patient makes life very easy because the greater trochanter just you know, pops up into your world. Um, especially if you're by yourself and you don't have a lot of help, it's a very easy technique. You just need somebody to pull on the leg a little bit and then you're in. But in this lady, at that time, what we did was essentially what you're seeing there, so scissoring technique. Um, she had um, a, uh, um, uh, an arm board underneath the distal fragment to uh, bring it to the right position. And then the entry point was a, greater troke entry point, um, nail goes in, just making it quick so we can move on. And then that's the final, the final uh, image. So you see the lateral in a second. So you'll notice that the lesser troke is broken. So it's almost impossible to use that obviously as a sign and, and nobody circlages that. Um, they do in Europe in some places, but in, in the US pretty unlike uh, unusual. There's AP, there's your lateral. So notice that there's a very, very long fragment there. Can you guys see that? That goes all the way down to the middle of the shaft. So these are the type of fractures where you really have to be cognizant of um, flexion of the proximal piece. And the way you look at flexion of the proximal piece is actually to look at the head and the neck versus the shaft. Um, you wanna get a good lateral view uh, like you see here intraoperatively though, and make sure that the anterior part of the neck is essentially in line with the shaft. I'll show you some more imaging with that. And there's lateral uh, distal locking. Another case, again, I'm giving you guys a little bit more complex cases on purpose. Uh, peritroke fracture, 55 um, year old, jumper 30 feet. Um, that's what it looks like. Notice that it goes all the way down to uh, almost the middle of the shaft fracture, right? So again, not a simple fracture. There's a little bit better image. 
patient also had a CT of the pelvis. So always take all the images you can. And here you can see that actually the proximal fragment is, is flexed. So the question is, how are you gonna, how are you gonna manage that? And obviously the patient also has a pelvis fracture, which winds up getting uh, repaired. But how, do you, how are you gonna manage that intraoperatively? And, and intraoperatively, there's a couple ways of doing it. I'll show you a couple of techniques here. One is obviously using a cob and pushing down. And here you can see on the left side, you just make a little, bit, a little small incision, a, a tiny bit anteriorly, not, not uh, it's like anterior lateral. Go along the neck and then push down. The biggest problem with this technique is that uh, the person who's pushing down has to push down throughout the whole case because you have to ream with, the, with this fragment in the right position. Otherwise, when you ream, you don't ream that fragment uh, intermedullarily and it just kicks up. So you got to make sure that the person is holding it. So you can't go for a smoke. You can't take a break. You know, you can't go to the bathroom. Um, you know, no beer pong. So you have to, you have to basically um, hold it the whole time. Uh, so that's the one negative about this technique. Um, that's what that looks like. Here's a good lateral view. Uh, and what you see here is basically the head, the neck, and the shaft are in line. What can you tell me about the AP view? Any problem? Any issues with the implant? It's too, so the distal screw is too, is too distal. So probably what this was, even though this is probably in, out, in. Can you guys see that? So be very, very cognizant of, uh, just like in peds, how you have to go around the world for screws, you have to do the same thing here to make sure the screws are in the right position. So that's what it looks like uh, after surgery with uh, also screws in the, in the uh, sacrum. And that's what the incisions look like. Another one, so I'm gonna skip this one. This one is really good only for, uh, to show you one technique. Uh, I know it's, a, it's not a, a mid shaft fracture, but you'll see here that the patient has sag of the proximal piece. And you can do this either for sag or for flexion. You can put a, a pin in the medial side uh, or the proximal fragment essentially from anterior to posterior. Um, and as you see there on this view, there's a, it's a shan spin that's going from anterior to posterior. <clears throat> and that's where it is relative to the nail. And then this is actually, I, I did this when Rosie was a resident. Um, so uh, we, I use vaginal tape. So you see that little uh, tape that's on that screw, on that shan spin. You take the vaginal tape, you pull up on it, and then you attach it outside the sterile field. Uh, with a clamp. And the reason why I do it that way is because, you know, this, this uh, clamp never gets tired. So it never moves and it keeps it in the right position the whole case. And that's what it looks like on the other side. So you can tell that it, you can see that it's being pulled and held on the other side. And the reason why that is because basically uh, you never have an issue with somebody, um, you know, shaking or forgetting or, un, you know, unloading pressure, etc. And that's what that patient looks like. I'm sure, I'm sure most of you have not seen that, but that's, that's a common thing that I do. Uh, another, uh, you know, subtroke fracture, same thing. Here, this is a, a trochanteric start. Guide right goes in, reamer goes in. So here he's in a little bit of varus. You guys see that? And we're using the... Um, uh, we call it the finger or, you know, intermedial reduction tool in order to actually get from the proximal to the distal fragment. So on the AP view is a little bit of varus. On the lateral view, it looks okay. Um, so we're going to fix that intraoperatively. So here's, uh, I, even, I don't think I showed you guys. Do I have the imaging? No. This is just a magic case because there are the screws and then it looks fine. But basically, this is the one where we use the cob to push down on that fragment. Okay. Questions? Yep. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, how, when you do the um, uh, version to get rotation, when you check the femoral neck, the lateral, technically, how are you doing that? Are you taking it and then swinging the C arm around to the other side of the table and do it? Because I've done a few times at SFGH where we like rotate the C arm uh, on its axis and then roll it over and it doesn't, you know, keeping the base at the same side that we're going to be operating or yeah. using it to operate and it just doesn't seem to work very well that way. Yeah, like so what the, I do the numbers is, numbers never um, match. I'll tell you, on the non-broken leg, 
I internally rotate that leg um, like uh, as much as it'll go. And what that does is essentially, uh, you know, brings in the C arm on the patella, let's say it's the right leg. So the C arm comes in like this, right? And then what you do is you go over the top and do it the other way. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so but you're doing that with leaving the, the base, like the C arm base on the on the same side, not like moving it all the way through the operating room to the other side yeah. and checking it. And you, exactly, yeah. and you can't always do that because some patient's version doesn't allow. So if the patient's version doesn't allow, um, what you do is, um, you know, you have to move the C arm from one side to the other. Yeah. I don't think you have any choice. 